the suspects months before the attack. NPR's Brian Naylor has the story. At a Senate hearing yesterday, there was nothing but praise for the actions of responders to the Boston Marathon bombings. Democrat Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island captured the tone of many lawmakers as he addressed Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitano. I'm sure you saw with the same pride that I did the way people pull together, the lack of turfiness, and the very impressive deployment of a wide range of local, state, and federal capabilities very rapidly, very comprehensively, and very smoothly. That lack of turfiness, as White House put it, was no accident. One of the lessons of 9-11 and subsequent disasters, natural and man-made, was the need for communication and cooperation among responders, says Carrie Lamack. She's director of the Homeland Security Project at the Bipartisan Policy Center, a Washington think tank. These were people who had gotten to know each other over the last decade because they had practiced before. Before 9-11, we hadn't seen that kind of coordination, so that when you had law enforcement agencies come together, oftentimes they couldn't communicate with each other, they had never met each other before. This was different in Boston. The Massachusetts National Guard was one of those agencies that played a big role in the bombing's aftermath. A guard unit was at the finish line helping provide security when the blasts occurred and quickly began clearing debris and providing medical assistance. Brigadier General Paul G. Smith says the guard was well trained for its role. And that means putting your ego on hold and recognizing that we support elected officials, and civil authorities, and we take our directions from them. Boston responders have also had recent practice working together with mass casualty drills and dealing with severe weather ranging from tornadoes to blizzards. Smith says all of that experience was put to use after the bombings. We have worked very closely with city officials, uh, local police departments, state police, the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency. So there's a history. We know each other. And, and I think most importantly, we trust each other. Still, if the lessons of how to respond to a terrorist attack seem to have been learned well, critics say law enforcement agencies still have a ways to go when it comes to sharing information that could help prevent an attack, or at least in identifying potential terrorists. The criticism centers on the trip to Russia of Tamerlan Tsarnaev, the 26-year-old suspect killed in a shootout with police Friday. Tsarnaev traveled to an area of southern Russia near Chechnya in January of 2012. Russia had requested a background check from the FBI on Tsarnaev before he left the U.S., and Napolitano told lawmakers yesterday Homeland Security was aware that Tsarnaev left the country, but he returned to the U.S. some six months later unnoticed. The uh, system pinged when he was uh, leaving the United States. Um, uh, by the time he returned, all investigations uh, had been, the matter had been closed. After a closed-door briefing to members of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Vice Chairman Saxby Chambliss, a Georgia Republican, said intelligence agencies had reverted to their old pre-9-11 ways, citing the practice of stovepiping or failing to share their information with each other. Post-9-11, we thought we had created a system that uh, would allow for the free flow of information between agencies and and um, I think there's been some, some stone walls and some stovepipes reconstructed that uh, were probably unintentional, but um, we've got to review that issue again. It's not clear what the FBI or anyone else might have done with more information about Tsarnaev, but it seems equally clear that he fell through the cracks prior to planting his bomb on Boylston Street last week. Brian Naylor, NPR News, Washington. Imagine this. A bomb goes off on a crowded American street. Dozens of people are killed and injured. Investigators have no leads except the bomb contained microscopic markers called tagants that tell police exactly where and when the explosives were manufactured. As NPR's Peter Overby reports, tagants are real, but the gun lobby and its industry allies blocked their use years ago. Congress has had some fierce debates about putting tagants in explosives. It came up after the first World Trade Center bombing in 1993, the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995, the Atlanta Summer Olympics bombing in 1996. The hottest question was whether tagants should be put into gunpowder. 
Here's a floor debate from 1996. Harold Volkmer, a pro-gun Democrat from Missouri. I don't believe in taggants and black powder. I think the study brings us to where you do have taggants and black powder. Jeff That's where it leads us, right down that road. Taggants are microscopic plastic chips, color-coded to identify a particular batch of explosives and designed to survive the explosion. The National Rifle Association argues they could dangerously destabilize gunpowder, also that they would cost too much. Also, as the NRA put it in the early 90s, that they could be an early form of registration. Taggants are made by a Minneapolis company called Microtrace. It sells them for all sorts of products besides explosives. And it supplies the one country that requires them in explosives, Switzerland. The president of Microtrace is William Kearns. From our standpoint, you know, it's technology that we have, that we make, and uh, it has a function. We know that it works in explosives. Kearns said that years ago, taggants were tested on explosives in this country. He says that when a pickup carrying two people was blown up, investigators could follow the tagging trail. It didn't take long for them to apprehend the person that made a bomb. He says the bomber was convicted and died in prison. But that came long before the wave of terrorist bombings, when politics took over the debate. After the first World Trade Center bombing, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms said tagging-free gunpowder would become the explosive of choice for terrorists. After Oklahoma City, President Bill Clinton sent Congress a bill to require taggants. Congress exempted gunpowder. The Atlanta Olympics pipe bomb led then House Speaker Newt Gingrich to start negotiating on taggants with the Clinton administration. Other Republicans cut him off. Here's Republican Congressman Bill McCollum of Florida. There are questions about the taggant issue, but the responsible thing to do is to march through this with a study. And that's what Congress did. Even now, manufacturers of high explosives feel that taggants aren't ready for prime time. That's according to Chris Rone, president of the Institute of Makers of Explosives. Representing the gunpowder side of the argument are the NRA and the gun industry's trade group, the National Shooting Sports Foundation. They didn't respond to NPR inquiries today. The frustrating thing to law enforcement and me in particular is we're not even having the discussion. Uh, it stopped. David Chipman spent 25 years as an agent in the ATF. Now he's an advisor to the advocacy group Mayors Against Illegal Guns. Cops need to be able to solve crime. It's what the public demands. It's what the media is asking now. How did these people get these, you know, explosives? What are the explosives? And tagants, in theory, could have helped in that. But instead, the idea of putting tagants in gunpowder is off the agenda. Peter Overby, NPR News, Washington. President Obama's time in office has not been defined by terrorism as President Bush's was, but incidents like the one in Boston have been a regular, painful through-line of his presidency. NPR's Ari Shapiro reports on how the president's response to those attacks has changed over time. When a new administration walks into the White House, nobody provides a handbook on how to respond to a terrorist attack. So the Obama administration has been on a steady learning curve. When an underwear bomber tried to bring down an airplane on Christmas Day 2009, the White House was basically silent for two days. Finally, Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitano made this tone-deaf comment on CNN while President Obama kept vacationing in Hawaii. The system worked. Everybody played an important role here. The, the passengers and crew of the flight uh, took appropriate action. That was a Sunday. On Monday, Obama finally addressed the country. The American people should be assured that we are doing everything in our power to keep you and your family safe and secure during this busy holiday season. Matt Miller was the Justice Department's Director of Public Affairs in those days. He says slip-ups have taught the Obama team some important lessons. You have to communicate early and you have to communicate often. And you don't have to tell the public everything you know, but you have to say something, and most importantly, what you say has to be accurate. Faltering at any one of those things can shake the public confidence. Accuracy was the problem again just last year when the administration responded to a terrorist attack in Benghazi, Libya. UN Ambassador Susan Rice took the fall for saying this on ABC. What this began as was a spontaneous, not a premeditated, uh, response to what had transpired in Cairo. The White House learned the timing lesson more easily. President Obama spoke the morning after Benghazi, and he made this statement just a few hours after bombs went off at the Boston Marathon last week. We will find out who did this. We'll find out why they did this. Any, respons uh, any responsible individuals 
any responsible groups will feel the full weight of justice. While those statements may sound like bland platitudes, Ken Weinstein says they're important. He was President Bush's Homeland Security Advisor. I think the American psyche and, and, uh, and the American people just need to hear that the president is on the job, he's determined, and that the uh, assets in the federal government are going to do everything it can to bring those people to justice and to prevent this from happening again. After a terrorist attack, a president has important roles in public and private. Behind the scenes, an orchestra of investigators works at a manic pace. The president does not conduct that orchestra or even write the music, but he must thoroughly understand every note. In front of the cameras, he has a different job. He must channel the nation's feelings, project resolve, and at times grief, as he did last week in Boston, remembering eight-year-old Martin Richard. And we're left with two enduring images of this little boy forever smiling for his beloved Bruins and forever expressing a wish he made on a blue poster board. No more hurting people. Peace. Michael O'Hanlon of the Brookings Institution says these moments show a facet of President Obama we don't often see. It is distinctive in my mind as, you know, revealing the emotional side of, of a man who often, you know, is a little bit emotionally controlled or removed. President Obama may not have come to office with a handbook on how to respond to terrorist attacks, but he has slowly crafted one over time through forced repetition. Ari Shapiro, NPR News, Washington. This is All Things Considered from NPR News. And it's WNYC at 519. Good afternoon, I'm Mark Garber. Sunny sky, 62 in Central Park. We'll look at the forecast next. WNYC is supported by the Collegia Chorale, presenting Song of Norway at Carnegie Hall. Ted Sperling conducts Sol Luis Santino Fontana, Jason Daniele, Alexandra Silber, Judy Kay, and more Broadway artists. April 30th at 6.30 p.m. Tickets at Carnegie Charge. The Graduate Center at CUNY, offering students the opportunity to pursue a challenging, customized master's degree across a wide range of subject areas, including migration and...